Welcome to The Bridge Online. No matter where you are worshiping from, we are so glad to have you with us. Today, Pastor Doug will be continuing his sermon series on Ephesians. Grab your Bible and let's dive in. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to continue in our study in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, hopefully you're getting a chance to dive in, continue to read and study the word. I don't know. I don't know if you're getting together. I hope you are. I hope there's a great coffee shop in Versailles. Um, you can go there. You can read the word of God together. Um, if you don't like coffee, we'll pray for you. <laughs> but if you don't like coffee, no, find somewhere else. Get together. You know, just because small, small groups are getting ready to start, you don't have to wait for small groups. You still get together and read the word of God together. Uh, hopefully you're reading together in your home with your families. And uh, because I believe what we said a couple of weeks ago that we see in scripture that when God's people start getting serious and real about their love for his word, that's, that, that's when revival comes. Amen? And so that's the whole objective here is let's learn, let's grow. Let's just say to the Lord, we, we honor your word. We want to know what your word says. Uh, we don't want to just hear it. We want to do it. We want to follow it. We want to obey it. And I believe that as God looks down and sees that for a sincere church, a sincere group of people um, that, are, that are saying that, he will bring a flood of revival. Amen? And that's what we're believing God for today. Ephesians chapter 2, let's go through the first three verses quickly together. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Is that anybody in the house today? We'll talk about that in a minute. In which you once walked according to the course of this war world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. Now, Paul gives us a very revealing picture of the terrible spiritual condition of all of us before salvation. All of us. I want to say it again, all of us. And so when I asked this morning about the first verse, is there anybody in the room that was once dead but now alive? If you're a born-again follower of Christ, you should say amen. Because like that, that's all of us, right? All of us were spiritually dead. And so what I want to note is a few things really quick. And if you're taking notes, just three quick points on these first three verses. Number one, as, it's, as he says very clearly, it, it takes really no interpretation. We were dead. And of course, Paul is speaking spiritually. Sin brings death. Remember, that's what it says in the book of Romans. The wages, the gift, the result, the consequences of sin is spiritual death, spiritual separation from God. And so Paul is just reminding, and, uh, reminding us of that reality. We were spiritually dead. We were unable to understand and appreciate spiritual things. In fact, we had no spiritual life. It was dead. And here was a very important point. We could do nothing of ourselves to please God. Today, the only way that you and I can truly please the Heavenly Father is by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, and doing things that are honoring and pleasing to the son. That's, that's really the only way. One of the great misconceptions, especially among Midwestern, Bible Belt believing, you know, good, red-blooded American folk, is that somehow God is pleased when we do good. You know, when we don't act like heathens, when we don't act like uh, like animal, you know, we treat people well, we're friendly, we get up and go to work every day, and there's a false sense that somehow God looks down from heaven and he is pleased with that. Now, now listen, I, I'm, I'm, it's good. All of that's good, but, but you can do all of that, and if you are not a follower of Christ, if you are not born again, it's not pleasing to the Father. That, that's, that's why Isaiah declared thousands of years prior that our righteousness, so that's what I would consider our righteousness, the good things we do. We treat our families well. We're good husbands. We're good wives. We go to work every day. We, we bring value to society. Those are all great things. The, the, the alternative to those is not the way. I'm not suggesting that at all. However, if you're doing those things outside of Christ, they're of no value. Isaiah declared it very clearly. Our righteousness in the eyes of God 
is as filthy rags, correct? And it's because we are spiritually dead apart from Christ. The second point, Paul tells us very clearly that we were disobedient. Since the fall of man, we have seen this to be themed throughout human DNA. Since the fall of man, we have chosen to believe the serpent and to walk in disobedience rather than to walk in obedience to God. That is the constant struggle that even as born-again Christians, we, we struggle with as well. We all struggle with this, with this force, if you will, since the beginning of time, since the, beginning, uh, since the fall, where, where man is constantly drawn to walk into, in disobedience. And if you're apart from Christ, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside you, you'll never win that battle. It's impossible to win that battle. Those of us that are in Christ, we're constantly struggling with the battle. In, in, in fact, let me explain it. There are three forces that are constantly encouraging our disobedience. At, at all times, whether you're born again or not, there are three powerful forces that are always working against us. They are the flesh, the world, and the devil. That, those, those are the three fronts that we struggle with and th the three areas that we battle. Uh, the, the world, as you know today, and the things that we're seeing, there are, it's contrary to the very nature of God. It's an, Paul said in another place that it's, there's an antichrist spirit. And that antichrist spirit has been unleashed on the earth since, since the beginning of time, since, since the beginning of creation, since the fall of man, right? And we're seeing it now revealing itself in a greater and more bold way, in my opinion. There, there is a clear antichrist spirit, and it's constantly working against the nature of Christ inside. It's constantly working against the truths of God's word. The devil, of course, we know he is a liar. He, Jesus said he has come to kill, to, dis, to, to steal, and to destroy. And so he's constantly working on us corporately, individually, trying to steal things from us, trying to discourage trying to get us to come to a place where we don't trust what God's word says. Remember last week we talked about how important it is to know who we are in Christ. Well, Satan is always going to work against that. He, he's always going to say, well, I know what pastor said. I know what, I know what Ephesians 1 said. Yeah, that's, but that's not you. That's not for you. That's not how you feel. That's not, that, those promises don't apply to your life. Those are the lies of the enemy. He's a liar. And, and the one that's probably the greatest force of disobedience in us is our flesh. You see, when we talk about being born again and our position in Christ, remember, we're talking spiritually. And, and the hard part is we still have this unregenerate, unsaved part of us that is our flesh. Do you understand that? So when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, your, your flesh doesn't get saved. Your, your flesh is going to die. Your, this body, this, this, this old nature is going to die. It's going to corrode, and it's a corrupted body, and you're going to be given a new body, right? That's what's going to happen when we are translated into heaven. And so the flesh, and predominantly our mind, by the way, when you're born again, your mind is not saved. Did you know that? Your mind has to be, has to be constantly trained, constantly equipped, constantly taught, what is truth and what is right and what God says and what God's word is. Your mind is constantly working against you to walk in disobedience. And that's, that's what Paul's reminding us is don't forget, we were all the sons of disobedience. And before Christ and before the knowledge of his word and before the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, we, just, we had no power against these forces. These forces are strong, but thankfully, that when we were born again, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Thanks be to God for the born again believer, even though these three forces are great, the flesh, the world, and the devil are strong. Thanks be to God, the power of the Holy Spirit is greater inside of us and gives us the power to overcome them on a consistent basis. Yeah, say amen. So he's telling us we were dead spiritually, we were disobedient, and then he says this, we were doomed. That's the reality, we were doomed. And, and, and he says it in the third verse, and he, he refers to us, he says, and we were all by nature children of wrath. Children of wrath. Jesus said it this way in John 3, verse 18. If you're taking notes, write it down. You can go back and read it. He who believes in him, this is Jesus, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already 
because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. These are the words of Jesus. If you are a believer in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? But if you are not in Christ, according to Scripture, both hear what we read in Ephesians and what Jesus himself says, you are already condemned. You are set up. You are on the path to experience the wrath of God. That is what's going to happen to every person who does not receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They are going to be judged by God. The judgment is going to be a very simple judgment. Did you receive my son and his sacrifice or did you not? If they did not receive the sacrifice of Christ by faith, and bend their knee to his authority and ask him for forgiveness and ask him to be their Lord and Savior, they will experience the wrath of God in eternal judgment in hell. That's the reality. And that's the, according to these verse, first three verses of Scripture, that was, that was all of our future. That was my future. That was your future. That is everyone's future who denies the work of Jesus Christ. That's a grim picture, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not very encouraging when you, when you begin to think about it, but it's important for every one of us to know. And here's why. Because immediately, look at the fourth verse. <laughs> immediately, all of this shifts, and it, it shifts very dramatically, and it shifts with two words, but God. You see, this, was your, this, is, this is the future. This is who you were. You were spiritually dead. You were disobedient. You were doomed. You were on your way to experience the wrath of God, but God stepped in. Thanks be to God that that verse of scripture is there. But God. Now, let's read. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, that's sin, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. These, that last verse, two verses that we just read, eight and nine, are, are pivotal verses in the, in the Christian faith, aren't they? They're verses that we use even when we share the gospel. When we begin to speak to others and try to explain to them this amazing gift that has been given to us by God, this amazing gift of salvation, we will often use Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, letting people know, like, look, it's not just about your good deeds and your good works and, and, and how you treat other people. It's about an experience with Jesus Christ, right? And it's very clearly written. And so immediately, everything just begins to shift. It, it just it starts to shift. Our focus shifts now. Paul brings us away from our focus on sinful man and our sinful nature and who we were before we were in Christ. And all of a sudden now, it shifts our attention to understand and know what God has done. Even while we were in that state, while we were completely lost, completely disobedient, completely on our way to wrath, while that was our state, God intervened. He already had a plan from the beginning of the foundation. Before the foundation of the world, God had a plan, a plan of salvation. And he said, while that was happening, but God, God was preparing this. This morning, it's important to know the state that you used to be in. Because if you, if you don't fully understand the state that you used to be in, you won't fully appreciate all that God has done for you. In other words, if, if you really look at your life and you think that your life prior to Christ really wasn't that bad, then all of a sudden, the things that Jesus has done really aren't that great. Are you with me? And, and that's the real danger in self-righteousness. And it is a danger. It's probably one of the greatest dangers of most of the people sitting in this room this morning. I'm just going to be honest. The greatest danger is probably not drugs. Most of you probably aren't shooting up heroin. It's, it's probably not sexual immorality. Most of you are probably pretty sexually pure. It's, it's, it's probably not thievery, lying, None of those things. You know what the greatest problem of most of the people that are listening to me preach right now? Self-righteousness. You think and you thought you were better than you really were. You need to understand and let the word of God speak to you and reveal the state of your condition before you came to Christ. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Because when you see how God saw you before Christ, wow, 
it opens up a whole nother level of appreciation for what Jesus has done for you. You were dead, you were disobedient, and you were doomed. But thanks be to God that Jesus Christ came, that while you were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you get it? That's why it's important. It's, it's, it's not like we're just beating ourselves up and we're, you know, Paul's bringing up our past and trying to make us feel bad for who we were. He's just making sure we appreciate the work that Christ has done for us. So then he lays out three other three things, three things. Just like there were three things that characterized who we were before Christ, now there's three things that he lays out in, the, in verses four through nine. Let's, let, let's look at them. First, number one, God loved us. Verse four. It says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love which, with which he loved us. The love of God is revealed in many ways. Would you agree? But the greatest way, if you will, or the, the way that we see love or experience the love of God mostly is through his grace and his mercy. It's only by grace and mercy that we can even be saved. Like it's, There's no work there's no effort that you and I can bring to the equation of salvation. And so the man can only be saved by grace and by mercy. What is it? Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. That's, what we're, that's kind of what we're talking about. So how would you understand the real mercy of God if you don't understand the spiritual death and the spiritual condition that you were in prior to Christ? See, when you begin to understand that mercy all of a sudden is a bigger concept. When you start to realize you and I deserved hell, and then you realize I'm not going to hell. I'm, I'm not going to spend eternity away from God. I'm going to spend all of eternity with God around his throne. I'm going to be in heaven. My eternal security is set. I'm in Christ, and I am forgiven and cleansed, and my future is set. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. I know what my future is. That's, that's the mercy of God. I am getting what I don't deserve. It's not, mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. It's the unmerited favor of God on our lives. I don't know about you. Are there, is there anyone here that's experienced the grace of God? If, if, if so, just say amen. Sure. It's, it's undeserved. We, we didn't work. It's, it's his favor. It's his goodness toward us. He's, it's him giving to us what really, quite frankly, we don't deserve. The second thing that it says is that he quickened us or made us alive. The King James says quickened, but the translation really means he made us alive. So verse 1 says that we were dead, but now we, we begin to see and realize that through Christ we are made alive. God has made us alive with Christ. And so we see all of a sudden this connection. Jesus coming to the earth, dying on the cross, being put in the tomb ultimately to be resurrected from the dead, right? He was dead, but then he was resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the example of you and I. You and I were spiritually dead, but now today we are alive in Christ. And then thirdly, he exalted us. Verse six, he raised us up together. That's us and Christ. Just like he raised Christ, he has raised us up. He's raised us to, up together and has made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our physical position, as we talked about some last week, is here on earth. We know that. But our spiritual position is seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, I don't, I don't know, and my mind can't fully grasp and fathom all of that. The only thing I know, based on Scripture, is when... When Jesus died, he came back, and for 40 days, he showed himself, and many witnesses, the scripture says over 500, probably well over 500 people who saw Jesus Christ living after he was dead. There were eyewitness accounts of Jesus Christ living on the earth after his death. Then, before he gets ready to ascend, he speaks to the, to the apostles, he gives them instruction, and then the Bible says that they watched him ascend into heaven. Right Now, what we know from there is that Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. That today, as we, as we sit in this room, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, we know the Father sits on his throne of glory. His, he is the God of the universe, right? Jesus Christ sits at his right hand. Now, with that image, think of this verse of Scripture for just a minute. 
He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you understand that? That today, spiritually speaking, we are, it's, already, it's already as good as accomplished. We are seated at the throne of God himself. Higher than animals, higher than every other creation, greater than anything else that God has ever created. We have a position of spiritual blessing and spiritual authority that's already set in stone because of what Jesus has done. Do you see it? He has established us and set us there. I want want to give you a picture of this really quick and then we're going to move on. In John chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you can read it later. We're not going to go there and read it, but if you'll mark it down and take some time to read it. But in John chapter 12, we see this amazing scene. Prior to John chapter 12, there is a story about a man named Lazarus. And maybe remember, remember Lazarus? Lazarus was Jesus' buddy. And Jesus gets word that Lazarus is dying. And so we know the whole story. Jesus goes, and by the time he makes it there, Lazarus is dead, right? And Mary and Martha haven't encountered. He, if you would have come a little sooner, maybe he would have lived. And he says, I got some news for you. He's going to live anyway. And, and he raises him from the dead, right? We know the story. He walks to the tomb. He says, open that thing, open that thing up. And then he speaks out and he says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come on, come out of there, come forth. The next thing Jesus says is, loose him and let him go. You know why? Because Lazarus was dead, had been in the grave, had been in that tomb for three days. He was, his body, even by his own sister's accounts, his body was stinking, Right? But Jesus speaks life into this man. He comes to life, he comes out, and he has grave clothes all over him. That's the death. That's just, uh, uh, it's, it's the bondages. It's the, it's the weight of sin. It's the consequences of sin. It's the death, right? And Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Listen to me. Why am I telling you all that? Because in John chapter 12, you'll read an account that after all of that, you're going to find Lazarus sitting at a table with Jesus having a meal. He's fellowshipping with Jesus. And that that image of John chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 is an image of what Paul is teaching in Ephesians 2. It's where we are seated in Christ because you were just like Lazarus. You were dead in the grave. Your body was stinking. Satan was rejoicing because he knew he had your life. He knew he had your children. He knew he had your future. But then one day, a man walked in named Jesus and he spoke to you and he said, it's time, come on out of that grave and lose him and let him go. And today you and I live free in Christ and we are seated at the table with Jesus. Somebody ought to shout amen and give God praise in his house. That's where I'm at. I'm seated at the table with Jesus. That's why, that's why, that's why David declared years ago, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You see, yes, naturally I'm still on earth and there are all kinds of enemies around me. There are enemies of the flesh and enemies of the world and, and enemies of the demonic realm and they're all working against me. But while they're working against me, my God has prepared before me a table in the presence of my enemies. I am seated at the right hand of God and I am in Christ secure and kept and if God's for me who can effectively be against me that's what Paul's teaching that's what Paul's saying you see you you got to get a little life in you I'm just going to be honest with you I'm a little disappointed at the reaction before but I see you're getting in a little bit you got to get in the word of God and you've got to begin to understand who you are in Christ you've got to get this it didn't just come watch Pastor Doug get sweaty and scream and yell you've got to get it in your spirit there's, there's enemies coming against you man you're, you're no match for the enemy you're not going to stand because you attend church here You're you're not going to be able to resist. The enemy is devilish. He's, boy, he's crafty. He comes up with some things that that you're no match for on your own. you got to know what the book says about you. you got to know where you're really at. you got to know what really is going on because he's a master manipulator. He's a master deceiver. He'll convince you you're broke. 
He'll convince you you're weak. He'll convince you you're dying. He'll convince you you're ineffective. He'll convince you of all kinds of things. He's always trying to put those death clothes back on you. He's always trying to wrap, while Jesus is saying, loose, let them go. Take that stuff off, man. You're no longer in the grave. You're walking with me. We're going to go have dinner. We're going to have fellowship together. We're going we're to sit at the table. But all the while, Satan's trying to put that. He's trying to come behind and, and pick up those, those pieces of cloth and just wrap you back up in that old position. But, but the first verse says it very clear. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespass. You're alive in Christ. You're an overcomer through Jesus. Are you with me? And so those three points are extremely important. God loved us. He made us alive. And today he has exalted us. Far above powers. Far, far above principalities. Far above everything that works against us today. And then we come to the 10th verse. The 10th verse is probably some of my favorite part of the teaching. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so now, seated with Christ in heavenly places, we are God's workmanship. In fact, I want to add, I believe that we are God's greatest workmanship. What I mean by that is, as we look over the galaxies and the world and the beauty of creation, and it's, it's a phenomenal work of art, would you agree? When you just begin to think about creation and all the beauty and all the splendor and the wonder of creation that you and I have had the privilege of being able to see, whether it be naturally, literally with our own eyes or seeing it through pictures, creation is glorious, and that is the work of God. But I believe the greatest work of God is taking an old dead person like you and breathing life into you and bringing you out of that grave and working in you to where now you're not just an old dead sinner, but you're an alive, living ambassador and representative of Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a work. And you didn't have to have been a drug addict and, and may, you didn't have to be, oh, a stone cold sinner, whatever, but you were dead in Christ and now you're alive in Jesus and not only are you alive, you are standing before, the faith, before all of the world as a representation of what God can do. This is what God can do. Let me tell you my story, we should be able to say. Let me, let me explain to you who it is that I serve. This is what God can do. We are his handiwork. The Greek word for workmanship means that which is made or a manufactured product. That should be a picture of every Christian life. We are a manufactured product. In fact, the word in the Greek is the same word that we use in the English for poem. And so today, you and I sit as God's poem that he personally constructed and personally put together. In one place, Paul, as there was some talk about Paul not being that great of a, of a man of God, and there were some some wolves that had come in behind him and tried to undermine his ministry. And, and, and I love Paul's answer. He's like, let them talk. He's like, you're my epistle. And in other words, they, they talk a big game. They don't do anything, but they talk a big game. He's like, but I came in, and when I preached the gospel, and I chose to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and nothing else, look what happened. You, the church, are alive and exist because of what God has done through my life. Are you with me? And he says, you're the, you're the epistle. You're the evidence. Today, you and I as followers of Christ are the evidence of God's handiwork, of his workmanship. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. We are a part today of the new creation of God. I'm so thankful that that new creation is continual. God's continually working. 
He's, he's continuing to do a work inside of us. I can't help but think of an Old Testament picture of Jeremiah being brought down to the potter's house and he watches a potter and he, and he watches the potter put, on, put the clay on the wheel and he, he does it. And then, and then as he's weaving that thing and he's working his hands and he recognizes that there's a blemish or there's a crack or there's a problem in the clay and so he just, he just, he just lumps it all back together and he starts over again. That's what God does for us. We, we haven't, it's not as though we have fully arrived, even though spiritually we are seated at the right hand of the Father, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, but here on earth, guess what's happening? He's continually continuing to do his new creation work inside of us so that we can stand on this side of eternity and be an example of who God is. He's a good father. He's a craftsman. He knows how to take your rough edges and work them out. We had a chance, Charlotte and I went to Tennessee a while back for a just short getaway, just her and I, and there was an old um, pottery place that we had been to years ago. We finally found it again, and we walked in. This place is, it was phenomenal to see the craftsmanship, and then it's all open so you can watch them, and you watch them do their work, and you just, you leave there thinking, man, there's some crafty people in this place, right? Can I tell you that that's how the world is supposed to be looking at the church, that's how people around you at your job and in your family and in the community are supposed to be looking at you. You see, yeah, you used to be nasty, but now you're supposed to be a little kind. And, there's, and then what happens is they be like, they used to be nasty, but now they're kind. God must be working in their life. Are you with me? They... I don't know, but I knew them before. They used to lie all the time. Everything they said out of their mouth seemed like a lie. Now it seems to me like they're telling the truth. I don't know what it was, but every time, that man, every time he spoke, cuss words come out of his mouth. I mean, that man, could, he cuss like a sailor. He talks with purity now. What is it? wonder what's going on. Are you with me? It's, an, it's evidence, it's, it's, it's a living evidence to the world around us of the workmanship of God. That's what he's saying. We, look at the 10th verse again, we, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Romans 8, 29 tells us very clearly that we were destined for good works. We were destined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what's happening He's continually forming us into the image of Christ. And so I want you to get this if you're taking notes. God has to work in us before he can work through us. A lot of people want God to work through them. I'm here to tell you, God's not going to work through you until you allow him to work in you. It's this, this, this strange, weird thing that we have in the church. Everybody wants to be a preacher. Everybody wants to be an evangelist. Everybody wants to speak to other people's eyes. Everybody wants a crowd to follow them. Listen to me. That didn't just happen. You got to go through some process before you get there. You, everybody wants to lead some ministry. They want to they want to just, they want crowds to come and talk. What do you, you, you got to have some stuff go. You got to go through some stuff. You got to let God take you through some process. There's some edges. There's some things in you you got to deal with. It, 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 we, we get this image and this idea that, that all of a sudden, well, God's just going to use me. God doesn't just use you. He, doesn't use, he can't use broken vessels. And so a lot of us, there's, we're still in that process. We're, just, we're still being molded and, 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 and strengthened. And there's some things that, are, that God needs to touch in our lives, right? And so God's got to work in us before he can work through us. But that's what he wants to do today in each and every one of our lives. The Bible says that he's doing all of this for good works. I want to focus on this for a minute and then we're going to close. Good works. Let me read it again, 10th verse. We, that's us, Christians, those of us who are following Christ, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You were created by Christ after the new birth. I'm not talking about from your original birth, your earthly mother. I'm talking about your born, from the time you were born again, born again in the spirit. From that time on, you were created by God for good works. That's why, that's, that's your destiny, if you will. That's your purpose. Saving faith 
always results in a changed life. Saving faith always results in good works. I know I'm going to step on some toes, but we just, if you'll read the book of James, James teaches it very clearly, very directly. James says it like this, you say you have faith, great, then show me your works. Because if you really have faith in Christ, you'll be doing good works. That's what he says. Okay. So, so sadly, sometimes as Christians, we struggle with this. We, we struggle with this concept. It's, it's not enough today to say that we have faith. We have to demonstrate it by our works. And a lot of us struggle with this. And here's why. Because of the first part of the teaching. We have so much emphasis, and rightly so, on, on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. We should. Would you agree? That's a, that's a pivotal, foundational Christian verse. We are, I'm, I'm saved by faith and by grace. It's not by my works. And so what ends up happening is we end up living as though now we don't have to do works. But, but if you just keep reading, there's, there's one verse. Yep, not by works. Don't boast about your salvation. We're not talking about doing works to be saved. The next verse says, though, because of your salvation, because you received it as a free gift, your responsibility is to do good works. We struggle with that for some reason. I'm not sure why. Let's emphasize both like it is in the scripture. I did nothing to earn my salvation. I'm not suggesting I did or I could. But I'm telling you this, because Jesus came and spoke to me in my grave and said, loose him and let him go, now come sit with me at my table. Because of that, he is expecting that while on earth, I'm doing good works. There is a responsibility for those who have received the free gift of salvation to in turn do good works. Come on, somebody. It's right here. That's, that's, that's your destiny. That's, that's your purpose. And so many of us as believers, we just minimize this place of good works in the Christian life. I mean, we get it. We know we're not saved by it. And, and we know, you know good works won't get us to heaven and good works don't please God. But, but we, we tend to use that as simply an excuse. I'm going to say it. I'm just going to be the guy to say it. It's an excuse. Because it's easy not to do good works. It's easy to just come into church and smile real big with your brand new Bible that you're not reading, that you're not doing anything all week, and I know you're going to heaven and just be all happy and giggly and then go all week and never do any good. That's easy. But that's not what the Bible says a real Christian does. A real Christian because of his salvation and because of his conversion, now does good works. That means they're looking for opportunities to do good. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Words of Jesus. Let your light so shine before men that they may... See your good works. We've taken, there's one verse of scripture, by the way, in this same teaching in the Sermon on the Mount that talks about don't let your right hand see what your left hand does in giving. Okay? We've used that as a pad verse for excuses like it's sickening. I'm amazed at how we'll take one verse in Christianity and mis misuse it. Into, well, I don't want anyone to see me. Well, I don't want to do, nobody to see what I'm doing. I want to do it all. This is the words of Jesus. Not mine. I didn't make them up. This is Jesus Christ. Red letter Bible, Matthew 5. Let men see you. Let, they know you was a heathen before. They knew you weren't generous. They knew you were selfish. They knew you kept to yourself and you only cared about you. They knew who you were before. Now you've got to let them see the work that's inside of you. You don't take a light and hide it under a bushel. You don't take a city and hide it. You put it on a hill and you let all the world see. I'm not who I used to be. I have been changed from the inside and it is translated by how I live on the outside. Somebody say amen and give God praise. 
Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. All of the, everything we need in this verse is here. It's healthy. So that they'll glorify the Father. I get it. I'm not promoting that you go around beating your chest talking about all your good works. Neither is Jesus. Let's just take it for the simplicity of what it says. Let the conversion, the free gift, take place. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the workmanship, doing the workmanship. It translates to your light shining and you doing good works, not for your own glory, but for the glory of the Father, so that people will see the work. Are you with me? That's, that's, that's what a good workman will do. I had a, a guy stopped in yesterday, was delivering some stuff, and he was a stonemason. Um, and he was proud of his masonry work, and he had some video, pictures, and he was showing me some stonework. You know, and he was proud, and he did good work. He should be. And his, his, he wasn't being boastful. You know, you can tell, can't you? Come on, can you tell the difference between someone who's just like, man, let me show you my work, and this is what I do, and someone who's like, oh, I'm the best stonemason in the world, and I, I did stonemasonry for the president in 1970. And you're like, maybe you didn't. You know, you know what I mean? You know people. Don't you? Okay. We don't want to be that, but we, it's okay to say, like, look, God's using my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help so-and-so. I'm gonna, I don't think that means we go around broadcasting it everywhere. I'm not saying that. But you don't have to hide it all the time either. Good works. Good works isn't always about just giving money and things either. You know that. A lot of good works that happen that have absolutely nothing to do with money or finances or gifts. Are you with me? Paul said it this way. Paul desired that Christ would be magnified or seen in his body. How can Christ be seen in us? Good works. Christ can be seen in you by the good works that you perform in his name. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let me read it. They'll put it on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace. Remember, that, that, that's that undeserved favor. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Let me give you a quick Just a quick teaching from your pastor. If you're selfish, God's not going to increase your seed. If you're a giver and you're willing to sow what God has done and what he's doing in your life and willing to give it to others, guess what? This verse says he's able to give you a lot more. But God's not in the business of filling your barn with unused seed. Some of y'all wondering, like, where's the seed at? It's because the little bit of tiny seed you do have, you're holding on to it. Let go of it. Release the seed. In other words, you, I get it. People have been mean to you. People this. I, I understand. Try being generous. Try being kind. Try being compassionate. Try to step out of your own mess. And I get it. It's hard. Because when you're in your own situation, you're kind of consumed with it, and I understand that. But, but what I'm encouraging you is step out of that by faith and care about someone else's need. Worry about someone else's problem. Walk along, along someone else and help them through their burden. That's seed. And the Bible says that God's able to make his grace about it. It doesn't say that he automatically does it. He says he's able. And then he says, the one who supplies seed to the sower God knows who the sowers are in the house. Hmm. That's the truth. He knows who the sowers are. And that's who he gives the seed to. Somebody say amen. Amen. Colossians 1.10. We're getting ready to close. Joe's come. Colossians 1.10. They don't have to put it on the screen. But it tells us that we should be fruitful in every good work. We should be fruitful in every good work. In other words, Christians should be the most generous givers 
in our community. But I'm telling you right now, I've been a part of this for 30 years, and I can tell you that that's not always the case. Christians should be the most generous people in our community. Now, this group is extremely generous. I'm telling you that. You, you see the fruit of that in what God does here in this church. God has assembled some of the most generous people that I've ever been around right here in this little small community. But it's, always, it's not always the case. Let me encourage you as givers, continue to be generous. Come on, continue to be generous. Continue to be kind. Continue to be loving. Continue to sow. Continue to give financially where there are needs. Continue to give financially into the kingdom of God. As you do, regardless of what happens in society and regardless of what happens in the natural economy, you are going to be in the economy of God and God is going to take care of you. Amen? Come on, put your hands together. One verse as we close, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, verse 15 is mine. What's yours too, but I'm, I'm using it. Why am I preaching to you like I am today? Why am I getting so excited? Why do I want to come down sometimes and just make you look at the Bible with your eyes, even though I know that's not good and right, but I'm like, just look at this. Come up right here. Why do I get that way? Because of this verse. The charge is we should exhort and rebuke. We should make this. This is important. This is legit. This is for your good. This is for my good. Are you with me? That's what preaching is. That's what teaching the word of God. I'm exhorting you. Come on, know who you are in Jesus. You once were dead, but today, if you are in Christ, you're alive in him. You are his workmanship. You've been called to good works. Those grave clothes are off of you. You are free to bless people, to do good to them, to be kind, to be positive, to be an encourager in the current world in which we live. God has set you up as his workmanship to the world around you. Amen? Come on, let's stand all over the building. Before we... We'll have two altar calls. The first one is for anyone in this room that doesn't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you're here and you heard what was said, that's not my teaching. That's the scriptural teaching. If you don't know Christ, the final judgment of that is eternity without God. There's not a person in this room that wants you to spend eternity without God. And today you can make a decision to instead of spending eternity without God, you can spend eternity with God. The only way to do that is to accept, accept his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. That's the only way. That's, that's the only way. But thankfully, because of grace and mercy, you can do it today. You can do it right now. If you're in this room and you've never done that, don't raise your hand if you've done it already. If you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, but today you want to, I want you to raise your hand and I want to pray with you. Anyone in this room, balcony, floor, is there anyone that today you want to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior for the first time? So I'm going to assume that every person in this room is on their way to heaven. Hallelujah. So now the next altar calls for all of us. Lord, help me to focus on who I am in Christ 
and help me to live each day to show good works. All right? That's our prayer. Lord, help me to do it. Whatever the Lord speaks, help me to show good works. Help me to live this outside of the church. Help me to know my position in Jesus. Come on, he's going to sing. You find a place. You can pray at the altar. You can pray at your seat. Let's let the Holy Spirit have his way. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, please like and share on social media to help spread God's word. If you'd like to give or you'd like to learn more information about The Bridge, please visit our website, thebridge129.org. Again, thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you next time.